I think we need to move on. Karen Fry will be, Fry will be our first speaker. She's a, um, it's a pleasure to introduce her. She's a faculty member at the Graduate School of Geography with involvement in both field and the satellite resource sensing, uh, remote sensing uh, activities as well as GIS. So she looked at large scale interactions between land, sea, and ocean and ice in the polar environments. And two main aspects she's working on are the oceanography part, biology and biogeochemical aspects of sea ice decline, as well as looking at permafrost degradation. So at that, I'm gonna let Karen go forward and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. So I'm gonna share my screen and hopefully you all will be able to see. I see it. How is that? Can you guys all see that? Yeah. Yes. Okay, excellent. Um, so thank you for that kind introduction, Jackie, and um, thank you for the invitation to speak. I'm excited to interact with you all on such an interesting topic. Um, I just have a few things that I want to say. I know Manfredi is going to speak a bit as well. Um, my perspective is going to be a little bit more from the CIs optics and observational side of things and I know he'll speak a little bit more to the the modeling and actual phytoplankton absorption um, physics. Um, so with that I don't really need to set the stage with this crowd because you all are aware of, of sea ice decline um, but I think it's interesting to note that it is not a linear decline so depending upon what time period you're looking at so the number of days lost per year over the whole satellite record on the left. And then on the right, it's just since 2000. So you can see that those um, areas certainly are increasing at a, at, a, um, at a more rapid rate over the more recent years and over the whole record. And in particular, um, you know, the, the two sort of big hotspots are in the Atlantic, of course, where most of those declines are winter loss of first year sea ice, where first year ice sea ice basically is transitioning towards open water. And on the Pacific side, where most of our field observations are, um, we're seeing much of that loss of multi-year ice transitioning to first year ice. Um, so I've been really lucky, um, much of which actually due to, to Jackie and, and Lee Cooper, the opportunity to go out into the field. So thank you for that. Um, but as you all know, sea ice certainly runs the gamut from being completely intact. You can see the, the photo on the left and in March in the Bering Sea. Um, and the photo on the right in the Chukchi Sea in July is just holding on to that matrix by a thread. Um, and you can see that extensive melt ponding and the really distinct difference in albedo between melt ponds and the bare, um, bare white ice that you can see in the matrix as well. Um, so I wanted to just start. Um, I noticed that Karavich and Bonnie Light are both on the line, which I'm very happy to see, and they can chime in as well. But um, to talk a little bit about our NASA field campaigns, which they were a part of as well. Um, you can see this MODIS satellite image from July of 2010, which is one of the days we were out on the field. And you can see the ice stations that we visited in um, the first year of the field campaign and also the second year of the field campaign where the ice was um, a little bit less extensive. And those, the second year is where we saw um, and were at least able to sample the um, under ice blooms that we saw, particularly on those stations 55, 56, and 57, as you see in the map. Um, the equipment that I've used with the, um, for the optical measurement is basically a profiling radiometer. You can see that ice pro on the left there, um, which is, has both a radiometer that measures downwelling um, irradiance and also upwelling radiance, which is the LUZ. Um, there's also an ED0, which measures, which is we, we use as a, a surface reference. And you can see each actually has 19 different channels. Um, you can see all the different wavelengths that each of the instruments have. So we've been using those to basically understand how light has been transmitting through the sea ice surface. Um, and obviously the implications that that has 
um, on the, the biogeochemical and the, the biological realms as well. It's peak balance. Um, so if I were to take you into the field with me, um, and if you were to ride on my instrument and go through about a meter and a half of the ice, and it's a little bit noisy to get through that 10 centimeter hole, um, but as you work your way down through the water column, you'll get a little bit seasick. Um, but looking up at the underside of the ice, I'm standing in the middle of a melt pond. And as you go deeper and deeper and deeper, you can actually start to see the outer fringes of that melt pond, which is very dark. Um, and, you know, we certainly have our quantitative measurements that tell us about this, but there's probably nothing better than your eye looking at this to give you a sense of really what's going on in terms of light transmittance through these melt ponds, which of course, if you think of the title of the talk, um, I'm sure you've heard uh, mentioned before that these melt ponds effectively are acting like skylights. Um, so you can see the, the um, boundary of these melt ponds. Um, and at the very bottom here, you're probably at about 20, 25 meters beneath the sea ice surface. Um, so you really get a sense of the contrast between the transmittance of light through the melt ponds versus the transmittance of light um, through the bare white ice. Um, I also put this on Dropbox. I don't know if it's coming through okay or if you don't have um, access to Zoom, but if you don't, um, you're more than welcome to download it and take a, take a look at it yourself. Um, so in the field, we were lucky enough to get measurements of light transmittance through um, several bare white ice sites as well as melt ponded um, sites as well. And in general, the ice is probably varying in thickness somewhere between a meter and a meter and a half, something like that. Um, these are actually measurements that were made by Bonnie um, and Dawn's team. And if you were to look at the light transmittance directly beneath the sea ice itself, you get a sense quantitatively of how different the ponded ice is compared to the bare ice. And in many cases, we're talking about an order of magnitude um, difference between the amount of light that's transmitting. So it really is a distinct, um, pretty obvious shift um, between these to surface conditions of sea ice. Um, the additional sort of contribution of the instrument that I was able to bring in the field as well basically allowed us to not only look at light transmittance directly beneath the sea ice surface, but also in the water column below. And in many cases, we were able to take measurements down to maybe 50 meters or so. I'm zooming in with these um, plots that you're seeing right here just to have a, a better sense of what's going on at the surface. Um, but you can see depth on the y-axis, wavelength on the x-axis, bare white eyes on the left, melt ponded eyes on the right, and then of course the colors are denoting the fractional light transmittance. Um, and so these are sites that are very close together. Um, the main difference is that, of course, the surface expression of the sea ice is either melt bonded or not. Um, so quantitatively, of course, they're, they're very different in terms of the light that's able to transmit. Um, if you look at similar data plotted in a slightly different way, you can sort of see other examples of, of bare white ice all along the top. Um, melt ponded ice on the bottom. So again, you're seeing on average maybe 10-15% transmittance through bare white ice sites versus 50-60% um, light transmittance through melt ponded ice for sites that are, that are just adjacent um, to those bare white ice sites. If you look at the inset of the plots, those are semi-log um, plots that effectively, if there were very little light absorbing impurities in the water column. Those lines would effectively be very straight. So for instance, the inset, um, uh, you know, for instance, down here with a melt ponded ice at station 68. But where you see those little inflection points, um, 
that's indication that something else in the water column perhaps is, is absorbing um, that light signal as well. So it's something to keep in mind. Um, if you look at a summary of all of our under ice optical profiles, you get a sense of how much light is coming through depending upon what depth you are in the water column um, and whether or not you're melt pond in the solid lines versus bare ice in the dotted line. So for instance, right at the interface, right up underneath the, the ice, um, you're seeing that red line with the melt ponds and then the red dotted line is basically the types of light that you would see in terms of transmission. Um, underneath the bare ice. And the important, important thing to kind of take away from this plot is as you get deeper in the water column, those solid line and the dotted line starts to converge. So in other words, you get far deep enough in the water column and you start to see everything. It doesn't really matter what the surface expression of the sea ice is because the light starts to converge. Um, so another way to look at that, for instance, if you're looking at individual wavelengths of light, um, you can look at bare ice versus melt pond with the two different colored dots, and you can start to see around 10, you know, 15 meters or so. Um, it doesn't matter what the surface is on the sea ice, that light starts to converge. Um, so that's sort of an important takeaway point as well. Um, the other thing, sort of takeaway point as, as well to think about when you're thinking about how light transmittance is um, impacting processes beneath is that there are a lot of complex features that we were able to observe. Um, we published this paper a few years ago that basically gives us a sense of what we lovingly refer to as the bulge, um, which you can see bare eyesight on the right that sort of counter to obvious physical principles, we actually see increasing light with depth. And that basically is taking place because you're in the vicinity of melt ponds in a small area of bare ice, and you're starting to see those melt ponds as you're going deeper in the, the water column. So this sort of inhomogeneous um, sea ice surface does a lot of really interesting, important things in, in terms of the light that, that the surface is able to. Um, just really briefly, I wanted to, to make basic, um, some basic observations of some of the follow-up work that we're doing with this that has to do with the biological, biogeochemical, as well as the heat balance consequences of this light, um, changing light transmittance. And one of my PhD students um, and I were actually really interested in how this increasing light transmittance would impact the dissolved organic matter, um, photodegradability of the material beneath the, the ice. Um, those of you that are biogeochemists, dissolved organic matter is really important and the, um, for a variety of reasons. Um, it, it can be associated with chromophoric dissolved organic matter, which is the colored fraction, which is also really important in terms of, of absorbing heat, uh, light, and, and therefore creating heat. Um, but we basically took back gallons of water from the ice water interface, took it back, zapped it in a solar simulator, um, and that gave us a sense of how degradable this material was over time, which, you know, in addition to algal blooms, is also really important for understanding the heat balance of these waters as well. So this sort of experimental work gives us a sense of how, how much light um, and sort of the ability for this material to, to intersect with light um, and degrade over, over time. Um, I won't go into great detail, but of course the, the big consequence that you all are, are interested in and familiar with are the under ice algal blooms that, that um, Laurie mentioned and that you know, I'm sure you've been reading papers on as well and probably observed in the field. Um, but of course, very heavily reliant upon the presence of melt ponds and the, the presence of sufficient light for photosynthesis. Um, so, you know, you can see just a quick example, even qualitatively, of what some of the under ice blooms look like in that panel C on the bottom left. Um, 
but in many cases, seeing a primary production rate two times that of even open ocean algae water. And then, of course, the blue water that you, you might have otherwise expected to, to see very little blue. Um, you don't have sufficient light for um, the last thing that I wanted to mention that, that kind of is going to, I think, segue to Manfredi's um, interest as well is actually work that I've been working on with Bonnie Lai and Regina Carnes, um, who's a, a postdoc. Um, and I wanted to, to just give a little bit of a hint of the types of um, heating that you can calculate based on the ability of having those light profiles. Um, and having an idea of how that absorption is going to contribute to heat and therefore have all sorts of other ramifications down the line. Um, so we're looking at our field sites as sort of a, a place to start and all of the optical profiles. And you can see the plots on the bottom are basically examples of three bloom sites that we saw in the field as they compare to a non-bloom site. In this case, it's a site we call site 100. Um, and you can see on the very left, site 57 versus site 100 has um, relatively high algae. The one in the middle has higher algae. The one on the right has the highest algae. That's actually where we saw the peak bloom. And the thing to take away with this and the thing to notice is that the presence and the concentration of that phytoplankton gives you a sense of where in the water column that heat is going to be produced and where it's going to um, be concentrated. And so, in other words, the more algae that you have at the surface, the more you're going to be able to um, trap that heat and accumulate it at the surface. Um, overall, theoretically, you sort of have that the same amount of heat that is being distributed through your water column, but where you have the presence of the highest concentrations of algae, it keeps that heat at the surface. And of course, that has incredibly important implications for the heating and the melting of the sea ice from underneath, um, perhaps the longer term consequences for having an open uh, and lengthened open water season into the fall. Um, so we're sort of in the process right now, sort of making those calculations and having a sense of what that means in real world numbers. Um, but again, the takeaway point with this is, is to do with concentrations of that algae distributing the heat in very important ways. And you can sort of see that, that example as the, the, the heat is being concentrated and um, increased at even shallower depth. Of course, has important implications for stratification as well. Um, so with that, um, I just have concluding remarks, right? So thinking about the spatially heterogeneous, unexpectedly complex sea ice surface with light transmittance, um, the light converging at depth, um, important implications for biology, biogeochemistry, heat balance. And then lastly, I think, um, you know, what you all are most interested in thinking about how this light transmittance <coughs> impacts the spatial distribution of the heat and therefore how it feeds back to an already warming system where you have the melting of sea ice and melt bonding and therefore um, changing light transmittance and things like that. So with that, um, I... Uh, We'll, we'll stop there. Um, All right. And I imagine that maybe you want to wait till the very end to take questions. I'm happy well, yeah, I think we can go on to the second one. Although if there's one question while we transfer the, uh, the um, slides, if anybody has one or just hold it to the end, that might be a good idea. If there's not burning, then, gear, then maybe I guess it's uh, Janet is giving the introduction. Thank you, Karen. We'll, we'll come, come back, back to back. questions. Sure. Okay, thanks everyone. Um, this is Janet and Trary from the Sea Ice Collaboration Team. And from our perspective, we are very interested in the connections between the biological and the physical aspects of the Arctic system. Mm -hmm. And it seems like such a challenge given the unknowns that are encountered in both of these complex coupled systems. 
So we are especially happy to hear from our next speaker, Manfredi Manitza, and Dr. Manitza is a senior research associate at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. Um, today, we're gonna hear about his work on the coupled impacts of phytoplankton biomass on the uh, physical properties of the ocean. And specifically, he'll be presenting some model results from his recent publication related to CO2 and ice loss, and hopefully I captured that correctly. So thank you, Manfredo, for joining us, and please take it away. Okay, I think I have to share the screen here. Sorry, I'm not very familiar with this system. Um, um, Karen, you'll have to stop sharing your screen first. Yeah, because otherwise I can, okay. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. <laughs> Share screen, desktop, uh, okay. share the screen, let's see if I go here, and I go here, and I go here, ah, uh, can you see it? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the introduction, and actually it was very helpful to help. Karen speaking before me because most of the things that she showed are related to what I'm be talking about in my talk. And so um, I call this, this talk phytoplankton life feedback, which is the first part, and then Arctic Ocean and climate change because I will try to link these things uh, to the Arctic per se specifically. So this is the outline of my talk. I will introduce first the phytoplankton, what I call phytoplankton light feedback, the mechanism that we're looking at that has been actually um, introduced by Karen in the last slides. Uh, and then I will present the um, state of the art of the modeling and the effects of this feedback on the physics of the ocean and the, bio, the, the um, feedback with the biology and biogeochemistry. And I will try to put this one in the framework of the changing Arctic phytoplankton. So I'm not gonna be talking about CO2 uptake or stuff like that, but more about the seasonality of the blooms and how these things can be uh, related to this specific mechanism we're discussing right now. And both in the, in the recent past, in the present, and I will just touch on the, the future Arctic climate and the, the interaction with this although that one is not really my work, but it comes from my work a little bit. And I will conclude. So here I have an animation I want to show, which is if I manage to show it here, yes. And so just to give you an idea about uh, if the temporal evolution and the spatial evolution of the chlorophyll concentration we can estimate from satellite. And so if you start from a global perspective, you know that you can see that the chlorophyll concentration, which or that represent the phytoplankton biomass, more or less, uh, is not a, a variable which is fixed in time. It changed in space and time. And especially when we're gonna move to the Arctic, you can see that the very high biomass is concentrated in the high lat systems. So if you look at these at a global scale that you can think of, uh, the forcing that is exerted by the phytoplankton biomass is changing in time and also in space. So you might expect different things when you compare the subtropical gyre, the subpolar gyres, and, and so forth. So um, just bearing this one in mind, this is just a simple um, representation of the process we want to include in numerical models. So simple, you know, this atmosphere ocean system and you have solar radiation, and that is gonna fuel when you have nutrients in the, in the upper layer of the, of the water column, the phytoplankton growth. So by the time phytoplankton grow, by photosynthesis, they have to absorb solar radiation. And so the absorption of solar radiation means also the heat absorption. So this absorption of the heat, I think it was in the plot that Karen showed at the end, uh, it shows two, actually two main effects. In the upper part of the water column, you have a concentration of heat because the particle absorb the light. On the other hand, there's another effect, which is indirect, 
uh, what normally biological oceanographer call self-shading effect. So if there's more concentration of heat trapping at the surface, less will be transmitted to the, to the subsurface layer. And so this is going to create uh, a change in distribution of the heat when you compare to the body of water, which is with no life. And so the other, the other um, aspect we're looking at is that if we consider the polar ocean, both the Southern Ocean and the Arctic, is that the interaction of sea ice. If you have a growth of phytoplankton in the summer, the warming of the water column might affect the concentration of sea ice. And this is something that we care about when we talk about the Arctic. So the, uh, the challenge is that how do we represent this process in couple physical biogeochemical models that we run for present climate or for future prediction? And this is something that I will show uh, in the next slide. So here uh, it's, um, it's a slide where I'm showing uh, a potential model that's been used by me in my PhD uh, thesis in 2005 where we try to include the effect of the biology in the penetration of the light. And so this parameterization then is used in the physical part of an ocean general circulation model. So you can see in the top of the slide, there's an equation that has three components. So IZ is the irradiance of a depth, which is calculated as a function of three terms. The first term that represents the, ex the exponential extinction of the infrared light and KIR is the light attenuation coefficient. And this is independent from the presence of, of biology, okay? The, the second and the third terms are the key terms of the equation where we're gonna see the link between light penetration and chlorophyll concentration. So this is a, a simplified model because rather than resolving the full visible light spectrum, we, uh, use an approach of two average bands. The first band, which is the second term of the equation, is the right light, sorry, the red light. The third term of the equation represents the blue-green average spectrum. And so the key part of these two uh, terms of the equation is the light attenuation coefficient for the red and the blue-green. And if you look at the slide, in the red is highlighted the parameterization of Morel where the light attenuation coefficient depends on the property of seawater, but also depends on the concentration of chlorophyll. So the higher is the concentration, the light, the, the stronger is the attenuation. And so the, the shallower is the concentration of the heat in the water column and then vice versa. So when you plug this thing in a couple physical biogeochemical model, what happens to the physical properties of the ocean and what are the feedbacks. So this is something that I, um, that I show a long time ago, actually in 2005, uh, in a global model. So on the left, I'm showing the change in the mean state as an annual average, and the right, I'm changing the seasonal, basically changing the seasonal cycle. So the first plot is SST. You can see when this is the difference in a simulation with and without this biological effect in the physics. And you can see that mostly is a warming effect because you trap the heat closer to the surface. However, in the tropics, now it's not relevant for this talk, but there's a change in circulation. So there's an enhancement of upwelling. And so there's a cooling effect. On the right hand side, you can see the amplification of the seasonal cycle of the SST. So warmer in the summer and colder in the winter. The cooling in the winter depends on what I showed in the slide, which is when you created a cold anomaly in the summer, that cold anomaly will be mixed in the, in the, in the winter. And so it's gonna cool the SST. That cold anomaly is generated by the, the shading effect during the growing season of phytoplankton. So this is something that has to be kept in mind, maybe for the change in the seasonality, for example, in the highlight of the system in the future. Another important aspect is the, the, the increase in stratification. You can see in the second panel, the decrease in mixed layer depth. And this is expected by the concentration of the heat at the surface. And the third panel is the change in the sea ice. And it, this is actually very important on the right hand side, you can see the amplification of more 
uh, melting in the summer and more formation in the winter. And this actually follows, in a sense, the cycle of the SST, which is also driven by the cycle of chlorophyll concentration. And the amplitude of that, you know, grows with the latitude. What is also interesting is that the biophysical feedback. So if you stratify more the ocean at high latitude, then you're going to stabilize more the water column. And so you're going to increase the, the biomass. So this is actually when you represent this with a biogeochemical model, rather than imposing chlorophyll concentration for satellite, you see this emerging as interaction between physics and biology, in a sense, talking to each other. So this is something at global scale that I showed a long time ago, but there are some hints about this. The new thing it was about the sea ice. So I'm going to pick uh, this part of, the, of the, the study and try to move into the, into the Arctic and relating this thing to the seasonality, the change in the seasonality of the, of the chlorophyll in the Arctic and showing some uh, recent work that I've been doing uh, with a similar model. So uh, on, the, on the left panel, I have this simple cartoon that compares the different blooms of phytoplankton in different areas of the ocean. Now, if you forget the tropics for a while where there's no seasonality, it's interesting to compare for present climate condition, the, ch the, the difference between a temperate ocean and a polar ocean. So we know in the Northern, in like for example, the classic example of North Atlantic, you have a Northern, uh, oh, you, have, you have, sorry, a uh, spring bloom, which is driven by the fact that after the winter, you have plenty of nutrients and you start to have an increase in stratification. So it triggers the increase of biomass. By the time summer comes, the nutrients are depleted. And so the biomass decreases. And in the fall, with increase of mixing driven by the wind, you have a, a smaller, a smaller uh, bloom in the fall, called fall bloom. So that is very different from the Arctic for the polar region, for example, in the Northern Hemisphere, where we know there's a peak. And so the peak is driven by the fact that there's opening of sea ice, the plenty of light after the winter uh, dark period. And so you have this peak in the growth of phytoplankton and there's decay. This is the classic view that we know more or less um, from biological oceanography textbooks, but things are changing in the Arctic. And I, on the right hand side of the slide, I am um, showing two examples that already uh, show the change in the seasonality at the beginning and at the end of the growing season of phytoplankton. Okay, the first study is by Madi Caro. I'm sorry here, there's a, there's a, I think there's a mistake in the year, I think it's 2010. But anyway, so if you look at the right panel, the blue shades show the, uh, basically the change of earlier bloom, the change in time of the blooms in the Arctic due to the early breakup of the ice. So due to climate warming, you know, as we know, the sea ice is basically um, melting earlier in time. And so there's a change in the, in the dynamics of the phytoplankton bloom at the beginning. They're following this trend. On the other hand, what is actually quite new is what happening at the end of the blooms as well. And this has been shown by Ardina et al. in 2014 which is, there's a delay, we know that there's a delay in the formation of the sea ice in the Arctic due to the fact that the Arctic is absorbing more heat. So it's more difficult to form sea ice compared to 20 years ago. So now um, what has been observed that the double bloom is emerging in the Arctic. So here in, I'm showing this plot from their paper. So you can see in the subpolar North Pacific and Atlantic, you have a classic double bloom. By the time you move into the Arctic, you have a single bloom and then the flat, no bloom is where you have perennial sea ice. But in their study, they're claiming that now moving in time, there's an increase in the occurrence in the double bloom in the fall because there's a delay in the formation of the sea ice. So if I go back to the other picture on the left hand side, what I'm saying that the blue, um, let's say the blue curve that represents the northern polar bloom, is becoming more and more similar to the North temperate North Atlantic by the time the warming progress. This is what we expect in the future to be more, to have an earlier bloom and then to have a delayed bloom, a, a delayed formation of the sea ice that trigger a new fall bloom. 
So some people say that they use the expression and that the Arctic will be the new North Atlantic in the future. So what does it mean in terms of uh, the radiant heating, uh, which is driven by the sea ice for the future? So this is something that I've not explored yet, but maybe for the discussion later is that if you have a, a drastic change in seasonality, <clears throat> what are the consequences for the physics of the Arctic Ocean that are driven by the biology. So what I'm showing here, just a hint, is some work I've been doing using a similar couple uh, physical biochemical model and see how these model respond uh, in terms of, bio of dynamics of the bloom driven by the sea ice changes uh, on the seasonal sense. So here I'm showing a simulation um, between 2006 and 2013 and I picked this to example the Eastern Siberian Sea and the Laptev Sea. So if you look at the, at the Eastern Siberian Sea for a while, this is the seasonal change in surface chlorophyll concentration. You can see that the dashed red line represents 2007, and the, all the other represent the rest of the years. As we know, the 2007, there was a decrease in sea ice that was very drastic, and it was followed by 2012. And you can see that the model picks one um, distinct pattern, which is an earlier bloom, which is triggered by the early breakup of the ice and the melting. So the models are already picking up this kind of signal when the, the, the right forcing is imposed. In the laptop C, actually you have the same effect, but it's also valid for the second event, which is 2012, which is the cyan dashed line, and you can see that compared to the rest of the years, <clears throat> the, the 2007 and 2012, <clears throat> excuse me, they, ch they show a marked earlier bloom. So you can see already in, in these models, things are changing as observed in nature. Okay? Uh, although the feedback that we're talking about here is not represented, but this is a starting point to explore certain things in the future. So if I focus now on the second part of the seasonal dynamics of the bloom, I pick two examples. One is the Kara Sea, and one is the Canadian Archipelago in Baffin Bay. And you can clearly see it already that in the simulation of present climate, there's a double bloom developing in several years. So you can see that, for example, in 2000, in the black line 2008, so there's, there's the first peak is in June, and probably due to the nutrient limitation, the bloom start to decay, and there's one is October, and then, so sorry, when is August, and then it's gonna pick up again. And this is what has been observed in the satellite record by Ardina. So basically these models already are able to pick up this change in dynamics of the Arctic blooms. So uh, the same thing is, for example, for the Canadian Archipelago and the Baffin Bay. You can see the, the shape of the double bloom emerging. So this is something that I've been thinking about in terms of, and it's for the discussion later, if we have this change in the seasonality, what is gonna mean, is gonna be probably a reinforcing effect in these, uh, these early blooms and also in the, um, in the late bloom. So another new thing, and Karen has showed this, things in the data already is the forcing from below. So if you think about these new un uh, blooms under ice, uh, this is something that is gonna create an extra absorption of, of heat below. And so um, this is gonna be another uh, term of the forcing for the melting of accelerating probably the melting of sea ice um, now and also in the future. And these two studies to show exactly that this is the data of the ice cape. The other one is the, inf the increased frequency of under ice bloom using a simplified model. So if now I'm going to the last slide and I wanna show actually something about the distant future. And all these models that we know um, when projected in the future, they show a nice free summer Arctic. And in this study, Park et al. explore this feedback in the future scenario and they show that the phytoplankton light feedback, they basically 
uh, that made the feedback as an effect of amplification. And you can see, for example, in the, um, in the bottom slides, the ice free days increase. And this is the difference between uh, both in the scenario of high CO2, but with the uh, feedback turned off minus the feedback turned off. And so you can see the difference. And also the biological feedback that I show in the present climate is also present uh, in the slide D, sorry, in the figure D, uh, in their study in the future. And they claim the amplification is about 20%. So just to conclude, uh, I think this feedback is a key link between physical and biochemical process in the ocean. And the thing, the new thing to explore is that these effect combine with the new seasonality in the Arctic. Uh, phytoplankton blooms. And another thing that we have to represent in the model that we can explore is this new uh, under sea ice bloom and how they change the physics of the ocean. And we have to bear in mind that probably this feedback will be an amplification factor uh, in the future. So I'll just conclude and then um, we can go to the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Manfredi. Um, we are getting very close to the top of the hour. Um, we are going to continue with discussions, but uh, we understand that if you have to leave, uh, we are going to post, and Meredith actually is going to post um, the um, notes of this meeting online. So that's a good way to catch up. I, I mean, are you referring to me? Perfect. No, no, I don't know. No, 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 I'm, refer I'm speaking in general to everybody. Okay, okay. Um, I have a question. Um, I, I read your 2005 paper, and, and now you're talking about the new simulations uh, where you can see uh, some evidence of Atlantification. Um, do, you, do you have, like in two, 2005, a prescribed atmosphere, or that's a couple component, a couple model for the no, atmosphere? No, uh, well, actually, the new simulation and all simulation, they're both force model. They're not, there's no an interactive uh, atmospheric component. It's not a couple model, it's a force model. I'm not sure this is, was clear in, this, in, the, um, in my presentation that the work published in 2005, he has this feedback represented. The new thing that I show now about the blooms does not have a representation of this feedback yet. This is just how the phytoplankton is in the Arctic is responding to the changes in the seasonality of sea ice, as is. Okay. It would be interesting now to introduce this and see the difference between the two simulations. Okay. Are there any, any other questions for Manfredi? Actually, this is Francis, if I can ask a question of Karen also. Sure, sure. To, uh, actually, thank you for reminding me uh, to any, any of uh, the speakers. Right. Yeah, so, so Karen, thank you. Actually, I actually enjoyed both presentations. And obviously, the, the last part when we get to the, the, to the trapping of the heating is, is really cool and see that, uh, how it's that, um, concentrating at the surface. And I'm hoping the data that we have may show some of it. But I was wondering, since you did this through the ice uh, directly, whether you were also able to measure any snow thickness to go with it and what the effect of that might have been on the light penetration? That's a great question. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good. Um, it's a great question. And actually when we were out there in the field, both times there was very little snow left. We sort of had a surface scattering layer there, um, but we actually weren't in the field when we did have snow. So I'd actually be quite interested as, as well to have a sense of, of how that plays into things. I imagine that that would dampen the signal even further. Um, I know, for instance, um, you know, with, with other field campaigns and experiments, they had a much longer um, time period to actually make those observations. So, you know, Bonnie Light and, and Don Perovich who are on the line might have some, some observations along those lines. But unfortunately with our observations, we were too late in the season to actually catch them. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Karen. I, I have a question both for uh, 
And Freddie and Karen, maybe it's the issue of having the nutrients, because if you increase the stratification with warming, uh, how do you model that? Or are you measuring nutrients? And, and I guess, Man, Freddie, do you put nutrient concentrations as just a static, or is that changing? No, because no, that'll the, have model, an impact. the model as prognostic equation for, and all the other biogeochemical models. So the, yeah, the nutrients will, if you run the model with and without the feedback, the nutrients actually will react to that. Yes, they will. And so the, the good thing of, you know, representing this in a couple model is that everything is, is changing dynamically according to the change in the condition. If you look at the other paper I published in 2008, I show there's actually there's the bio, it's about the biogeochemical consequences of that. And you can see that the nutrients actually are rea the seasonal cycle changes and there are other changes in life. For example, iron supply in the, in the winter in the Southern Ocean because there's more mixing uh, due to the cooling effect. So everything is just a um, uh, response to the initial perturbation. Okay. Karen, because I know what, Karen, when you go out, you measure, are measuring phytoplankton and so forth. So do, and probably co collaboratively nutrients. So that is in play too in your analyses. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I didn't show any, um, any of our nutrients, but yeah, at all of our depths beneath the, the water column, we took measurements of nutrients in the, in the ice and then also in the, um, in the water column beneath as well. Okay. Um, and we, we do see dilution effects from sea ice melts. Um, so you can see that obviously in the salinity, but also in the nutrient concentrations as well. Um, because when these systems, at least the sea ice isn't really adding, it's, it's more diluting um, as far as nutrients go. Um, but that's, those are certainly important observations that, that we have that, yeah, I'd be happy to look at that further with you as well. Thanks. Are there, are there some other questions? So Olivia? Yeah. yeah. Jeff, Jeff Curry here, question for Karen. Um, I'm sorry, did I jump the gun here? No, no, you're fine. You're fine. Go for it. Um, the, you, the fascinating, by the way, um, the difference between your between the readings in the ponded versus unponded and the bulge associated with the blending is is fascinating. Do you have any data from uh, chucked from uh, an area with no ponding ice whatsoever? All uh, all snow covered. That'd be an, an interesting comparison. Yeah, absolutely. No, the, the time period that we were out, I think we purposefully went during ice breakup. Um, so by default, we were there when there was an extensive amount of melt bonding. Um, but I imagine, yeah, you would sort of have similar cases as the bare ice, but you would have less, even less light transmittance because the snow is going to dampen that even further. So yeah, I mean, it would be a brilliant exercise to be able to, to take these measurements over time in one place, which certainly some researchers have done. But with these observations, we were sort of at the whim of where the ship was at any one um, time, as I'm sure you can all relate to. Um, but, but yeah, absolutely. You, you would have a, probably a much simpler system without mill ponds, absolutely. Yeah, understood. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Guillermo, I know you had another question. Yes, this is a question for um, both um, Karen and Manfredi, but it's a modeling question. Big picture question. Uh, should uh, IPCC models include uh, this feedback? Uh, well, I can say that <clears throat> what they did for the study of Park et al, uh, that one is an IPCC class model and they represented that. I don't know okay. now, for example, for CMIP6, they will have these things as a standard um, feature. Uh, my, my sense is actually no, uh, but A, I think is gonna, I mean, I think it's gonna vary a lot from the groups, but it maybe they have to have a standard condition for, for the experiments. So mm -hmm. I don't, I mean, my sense is actually no, I would say no, but I'm not sure. It's difficult to say from, me, from my point of view. Okay, 
Thank you. All right, are there, are there other questions? Yes, I have a question here, Yvette from OSU. Yvette, you're up. Um, I have a question in terms of the heat. Uh, we know that the cells absorb the lights and a part of the lights go to fluorescent uh, and part goes to heat. So, um, and it's a, a large part of the cells that release the lights in terms of, of heat, the light absorbed. So, um, a word, and also we know that the chlorophyll content of each cell will vary with the light and the nutrient. So are we uh, actually capturing in model as well as uh, in um, using the chlorophyll in the field to calculate the heat trap? Do you um, have a feeling that you capture um, really the, the heat itself that is, that is there transformed because of chlorophyll? Um, so my question is twofold. What do we do with the heat from the cells themselves? And second of all, uh, since the chlorophyll content of each cell will change drastically with uh, the light intensity and the nutrient, is the chlorophyll the right um, measurement to use uh, to look at the light attenuation and heat trap? I guess the question is for me, right? <laughs> well, for both. <laughs> <laughs> Karen, you want to say something? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a really important question, and I guess the short answer is we don't know. <laughs> or I don't know. Um, but I think it's worth exploring more, more fully to get a sense of how that actually breaks breaks down and how it how it um, how those individual components contribute overall okay any other comments related to that question well i can comment that on that saying that this is an approximation of what uh what we can do so far i don't i never really got into the details of i mean the, i see the point and actually it's a valid point for the question i never got into the details of that and so i think the parameterization work was worked out by andre more a long time ago using these tanks in the lab and measuring things you know with a known concentration of pigments this is just a very simplified approach all right, thank you. Um, but it's, but it's, it seems actually that in the in other studies as as improved um, uh, as is uh, the um, the performance of the models in for example in in ENSO representation and stuff like that. So it has some validity. I'm saying although probably is not um, very accurate in a, in any detail. Yeah. And I guess getting, getting back to the nutrient and modeling question as well, I mean, I think it's such an important point to keep in mind that it's, in terms of nutrients as well, it's an incredibly heterogeneous system. And just because you're getting melt ponds and declines in sea ice does not mean that you're gonna get blooms everywhere. And so having an idea of where those water masses are and the availability of nutrients um, is really complex. And so being able to handle that complexity, I think, is really important before you just throw it in a, a model and assume sort of, you know, same conditions all around. So, I mean, it's, it's a challenge for sure. 